Now, if energy starts to build up, as it often does around one of these great uh, avatar creatures, uh, godlike uh, presences, energy builds up, and if it's used externally, you get the Catholic Church. You get a system where men go around in robes putting down women. And I suggest to you that any time you see a man, uh, Rizzi, going around in a robe, and uh, he's putting down not just all attachments, but putting down women, or putting down sens sensuality and sexuality, and he has any sort of a system out here going, watch out. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, those of us who are in the radical tantric camp <laughs> sometimes think that all politics is homosexual. I mean, what are they doing fighting each other? <laughs> Why aren't they home with her? <laughs> or home, uh, you know, doing their own. As soon as uh, this energy starts, uh, if you remember this structure, in fact, it's a very interesting spiritual trip. Just read a simple primer on atomic energy and the structure of the atom. You'll learn a great deal about how to make love. <laughs> That's the basic structure of the, of the situation. Um, as I understand it, you have this proton in the middle with an incredibly powerful uh, charge. And then you have uh, the electron spinning far around it. Now, uh, the way you can tell them apart, and they come, she comes in many forms. <laughs> As the proton is God. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> Uh, there are different charges in the proton. Uh, you're charging one in the proton, it's hydrogen, and there's one electron up there, and then uh, two, four, six, eight, you know, up to the hundreds. Uh, but you always have that balance of the electrons up there and the um, uh, proton here. That's what we mean at one level. We talk about the psychedelic marriage. And then you ask about neutrons. Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> Uh, they certainly contribute to our creative culture, and I don't think they should be put down. <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, they uh, are probably at the higher level than we, and the next time around we'll get decharged and uh, won't have to worry about the messy complexities of the plus-minus yin-yang marriage. <laughs> because <laughs> it's... Uh, uh, it gets pretty complicated because the, the, the neurological marriage, spiritual marriage, psychic marriage is uh, you're turning on more energy, the more possibility of receiving and sending energy, and uh, you're just multiplying the, uh, the uh, possibilities of, of hedonic gap. Now, um, when I say that all politics is a faggot hassle, <laughs> what is he saying? <laughs> Why aren't they home with her? <laughs> you see, um, Eros. Arrow spelt backward is sore. <laughs> and I think it, it's, uh, it's no accident that uh, you know, re religions, <laughs> religions which uh, give you the spe spectacle of lots of men uh, going around in robes putting down women and sexuality tend to produce uh, the best policemen, and the uh, hottest wars. Uh, I do not think that's an accident. I remember once being in Rishikesh uh, and visiting an ashram, and there were a lot of uh, men in robes there. That's good. Uh, they're Rishikesh, that's good. Uh, matter of fact, the men who were leading this ashram were really, uh, I could feel their vibration, and it was strong enough that uh, uh, I, I could see how Perhaps I, another time, or anyone would just sit down and follow that vibration. Uh, but uh, rather, one rather uh, disturbing event happened. I was at a meditation, and uh, perhaps uh, in uh, my honor, uh, many of the younger uh, uh, monks, very handsome, well-groomed men, uh, uh, young men, um, like did a graduation recital. They all recited like for 20 minutes their knowledge. 
And really, it was incredible. Uh, it was all a put down of woman and how her body is full of mucus and is covered with hair and uh, <laughs> not to mention alimony and henpecking. And, uh, <laughs> um, now, when I was a psychologist long, long ago at Berkeley, I worked at the University of California Kawa Clinic. Uh, any, for my former patients, you got my apologies. <laughs> I met, I was at the bathroom, that's when it was me, and I was there about a month ago, and there was a lady in the bath, and she popped up out of the bath, you know, and she said to me, I'm a former patient of yours. I said, oh, do you forgive me? <laughs> she popped out in the tub for about half an hour, and she said, yes. <laughs> When I was there as a psychologist, the hip issue then was identity crisis. Eric Erickson and there all the students of Cal were having identity crises. Uh, and there were many young men that were having homosexual crises. Um, I consider most organized religion to be an identity crisis, if not a full-blown homosexual panic. <laughs> I say, here's the problem. Uh, half of us are born, uh, perhaps in this time around, to, uh, we're basically genetically charged uh, to keep the messy thing going down here in the body, and others are released from that and can zoom out during this lifetime. Uh, now, what happens? In this culture, uh, let's say, I would say that maybe 50% of the Catholic priests are, you know, rugged uh, uh, astrological types that are only priests because the mother and father said, now you got to be a priest and reward conditioning, the social conditioning got them to be a priest. I say 50% of the Catholic priests uh, should be out doing Tantra if it weren't for bad social conditioning. We should not take their karma into account. But I would also say that, they're, you know, Protestant ministers are supposed to marry. I say 50% of the Protestant ministers probably uh, uh, should not be performing the Tantric role. Uh, so much for the differences between these two approaches. Um, <laughs> let there neither be envy nor putting it down <laughs> as we move forward on this voyage. I want to read from our Bible. Uh, this Bible is entitled... Tantra Art, its philosophy and physics. Uh, it's incredibly a beautiful book to, to handle. It's, uh, in fact, uh, there are technicolored mosaics in these pages if you know how to look. <laughs> the first uh, page says, In Search of Life Divine. From Brahma to a blade of grass. Everything in the world is the creation of Maya Shakti. By the same author, get this. Folk art of Bengal, the folk toys of India, Indian primitive art, the author extends his sincere gratitude to those who must remain unnamed and initiated him into Tantra art, the exploration of which has been for him over a decade an engrossing spiritual adventure. His thanks go as well to, and then he mentioned several uh, professors who aided materially in making of this book, and a final indispensable expression of gratitude to Sudha, who first instilled and then furthered a passion for a path so ancient and so new. And with her, the author remembers something more for which the right word can never be found. And the inscription of the book to her. Oh, 
two or three years ago, before I understood uh, what I now understand about these uh, biophysical matters, it used to disturb me any time someone would come to talk to us at Millbrook if they came single. Because then they will, uh, hey man, where's your proton? Yeah. And here's an electron spinning through looking for God. You're sh -sh -sh -sh. We had, so, you, know, you know, the chemical heat that's burning, explosion, and so forth comes from electrons, uh, clouds of electrons from one atom to the merging. Uh, the proton thing gives you the the other hit. We had a lot of electrons spinning through uh, Millbrook and through Harvard. And uh, I said, well, uh, where's your better half? I mean, in a way, we're kind of monsters going around with just half of us there. Where is she? Uh, I now realize that I was uh, absolutely in error there and that um, the question to ask anyone who approaches you about spiritual matter uh, is either where is she or where is he and where is the sound? Um. The psychedelic marriage is the attempt to reach union at all levels of consciousness to work out harmonies of increasing energy intensities. The union of the 21 yogas that I discussed. Now one of the keys in the relationship between male and female, one of the things that tells you uh, how it's going is simply uh, like the space-time coordinates together, where, and in what position. Posture is a, a very obvious and important key in reducing the hedonic gap. Now, practical rule number one of the neurological marriage is that uh, you're never, as an electron, part from the proton, or as one part of a helical system, uh, you're never very far from the other part. The question is always asked, uh, well, uh, where am I going now and why? Uh, am I going towards proton or away, and why? Now, the, any marriage involves some sort of an interaction at the emotional level. Uh, many marriages, many marriages exist uh, not with emotional harmony, it was some sort of an emotional lock, that is uh, sadomasochistic or power submissive or nurturant dependent, uh, where uh, it's this emotion, the fear, attached to losing my, uh, losing my uh, leader or uh, losing my subject uh, or losing my victim, the fear of uh, uh, losing simply uh, at that emotional level. In order to uh, pursue a spiritual marriage, obviously, you have to uh, have centered things at level six. There has to be increasing, increasing trust. Now, there are two postures that, you know, that are involved here. Um, if you trust your avatar, you're, you're, you're always facing him. The, the Islamic people have a beautiful thing going when they face Mecca five times a day. Uh, if you know that everyone's looking at Rishikesh, or everyone's looking at Rome, uh, that's your posture. You trust. You trust. The posture for the uh, neurological marriage is, uh, of course, you're facing. You're facing. Where does it take place? Um, 
Are you all facing forward in a temple? Are you all facing Mecca? Are you all facing Rome? Trying to get that vibration? Get that laser beam going? Or are you facing her? Are you facing her? The uh, level five marriage is a sort of marriage that is advertised in um, this computer dating business. <laughs> you fill out a computer dating questionnaire, you simply find out what re social rewards and punishments uh, you and she share. Uh, I think that's the typical marriage. We both like to bowl, and uh, we're both uh, Democrats, and we're both. A f <laughs> well, neither of us like to swim, and uh, we're both afraid of higher taxes. Uh, uh, if you wish to transcend the reward, punishment, social conditioning marriage, uh, you have to start arranging your uh, your surroundings in such a way that uh, you're going to uh, get to a higher merger. Uh, <coughs> the temple becomes the home uh, in the neurological marriage. It's not something out there where you go with lots of other people. It has to be the inner shrine. Uh, all the rituals, which are simply the, uh, the um, uh, experimental trappings you use to get to your goal, attend to the... Uh, spiritual and, and get harnessed together. <coughs> That's why uh, there does tend to be a merging of external gain. I remember uh, meeting a tantric married couple in India about four years ago. It was really an impressive experience. She went, oh yeah, very, very easy diagnostic sign here. You, you know, uh, you have a, 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 a uh, psychedelic marriage or a tantric marriage couple uh, uh, on your hands. If you can think of a couple that you know and you've never seen them separately, uh, you've never seen him without her, that every time you see them, it's that way. Uh, we know about 50 such couples that, uh, see, after a while, uh, these, these emanations and vibrations, the helical uh, thing, just it cops your mind too, so that you never say their names uh, apart. You're never thinking of saying Joe. It's always uh, you know, Joe and Joan. Uh, it's just one person. Uh, we know oh, several score of such couples. And uh, of course, when you're in the presence of such a couple, if you're alert to these hedonic matters, it's a very powerful experience because you are literally dealing with a um, with a. a, a double merged entity, which all biochemistry tells us is more than the addition of its uh, contingent parts. I recall this the first couple that really caught my uh, head uh, in this direction in India. Um, they lived in a little house. Uh, he had graduated um, from uh, Oxford. He, he was a Hindu, but he graduated from Oxford. I think he wrote his PhD thesis on D.H. Lawrence, and um, um, she was a highly cultured uh, European woman. And they'd been living in this little cottage for, I don't know, how many years. Uh, they dressed exactly alike. They had their clothes, uh, their robes made in the village. Uh, you would see them wandering together on the hilltop uh, at uh, sunset. Uh, occasionally, you'd see them walking down into town. Uh, after a while, you realize that uh, they woke in the morning and they brushed each other's hair. Uh, they dressed each other. Uh, the, uh, the whole rhythm of life, everything that... There was nothing uh, that they ever saw that wasn't uh, a shrine object uh, uh, aimed at enhancing uh, the sacredness of uh, what they had going. Uh, it's, it's a powerful experience to be in um, the presence of such divinity. Um, so for union, once we have broken through the hedonic barrier, actually, uh, Mating and marriages are a lot easier when a, when a couple can break through uh, the sedotic barrier into level three and four. That means they start smoking a lot of grass together. <laughs> and you see what happens in a, in a uh, level five, level six home. 
The husband and wife wake up in the morning, and uh, he takes a shower, puts on his clothes, and has quick breakfast and drives to work. Now, every game, conditioned game he plays, he's getting farther and farther removed from the sort of conditioning game she's playing. So they literally are uh, in two different rat mazes. And she's down at the supermarket and then at the PTA and then this and that and so forth. And he's manipulating these. And uh, their consciousness is you know, completely separate. Uh, they are, uh, in every sense, uh, uh, you know, dividing farther and farther apart. Um, but once you, the marriage breaks through into these uh, unconditioned levels, uh, incredible new games of communication develop. Uh, because uh, everyone's hedonic diagnostic index will show you that uh, you have a different hedonic profile than your wife. Uh, even at the sensory level, you mo both may be uh, A plus on sensory. <laughs> you, you pass sensory 1A and marijuana 1B. And <laughs> but still, uh, her thing is sound and music, where you are more into uh, maybe... Uh, taste and touch, uh, and she's always turning you on to new scents, uh, but uh, you've been very agile kinesthetically with yoga, but she can sure dance. See, so that uh, an incredibly interesting uh, exchange of energies as you open up these energies and uh, exchange of yogas, how to control these energies, the, the dance becomes more and more complicated. Um, you see, uh, if... Um, if the husband doesn't go off to work, but stays home all day, or they both go off someplace together, um, they begin to share through the day the same sensory uh, repertoire. Uh, they're more likely to smell alike. Uh, they're eating the same food. Uh, the uh, whole repertoire is, is more and more unified, so that pretty soon... Uh, uh, there's uh, telepathy begins to develop, uh, not just because, uh, uh, not just because the level five rat maze conditioning turns are uh, unified. That's part of it, because we're both in the same maze, trying to get out of the same maze. But uh, the uh, just the straight chemical uh, neurological level of which sense organs are being turned on by what. I, I, an interesting example of this. Uh, Oh, and see, by the way, uh, I'm interested in the beetles as a, uh, as a phenomenon. I think they're evolutionary agents. I think they come from another planet. Uh, I can be talked out of it, but I haven't been able yet. <laughs> uh, and everything is happening with the beetles. You know, they were the four, the fab four, the fab four, the beetles, the beetles, yeah. Oh, they were married, yeah, but they were the beetles. They always traveled uh, together. They couldn't bring their wives because they were being mobbed by all the, uh, the beetles, the four beetles, yeah. If you notice what's happened with them, uh, now it's... Um, John Lennon and Oko. Namaste. <laughs> or we have an interesting report from Rishikesh when uh, Ringo uh, was uh, interviewed when he left Rishikesh and, uh, and he said, uh, why are you going back? And he said, uh, Maureen and I want to go back and smoke some dope. Now, it's not the smoking dope I was interested in there. It was that he said, Maureen and I. Get it? Maureen and I want to. Yeah. Maureen and I want to. Not the Fab Four, uh, or not that I want to. He said, Maureen and I want to. Um, <laughs> I do believe that the, uh, the great historical avatar sculpture design painting of our new Aquarian age is going to be somewhat along the lines of that picture of uh, John Lennon and uh, his Shakti, it was published in the record and in the Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, I think that's a historic uh, religious, because uh, we have to compare that uh, favorably with the classic Yab Yung position of Buddha and his Shakti uh, from all Tibetan and, and Tantric Buddhism. And then we have to compare that picture as a potential avatar uh, with the classical do-it-yourself unity avatars. Uh, on the cross, or sitting in the lotus position, or flying up to heaven alone, or whatever. Uh, the level three communication is um, uh, of great interest. 
Uh, after a while, you begin to breathe more together. I'm sure that most of you, or many of you, have had the experience in an session of feeling your body merging with another so that there's just one heart, one pulse, one rate of circulation, one rhythm of breathing, one heart. Then uh, the fibers begin to grow, and uh, one, one heart, one body. The uh, merging at the somatic level, or in technical terms, the merging of chakras, is uh, a discipline which uh, I think uh, is going to uh, involve many university courses in the ecstatic university of the future. <laughs> now, I said that once you break through the hedonic barrier, it's easier for a while to uh, keep the marriage going at a uh, closer and closer union because we, when you come right down to it, we are fairly similar. We have the same sense organs, uh, eyes and ears and kinesthetic and smell and touch, and we have pretty much the same organs that can merge and get in rhythm or out of rhythm and so forth, and we can start charting these rhythms uh, because uh, we have the same equipment. But when you get to level two, it becomes very tricky because level two is the level of, uh, of your genetic or racial or mythic uh, personality. And here, baby, you get an entirely different ball game going because it's a new set of conditions and you may find out that although you and your Shakti share the same condition reflexes and that you're uh, wearing the same clothes and you're, all your organs are hooked up and you're, you're able to move in and out of, of all sorts of sensory rhythms perfectly and you're the hippest couple on the block <laughs> and suddenly you get uh, too far into uh, level two and you realize that um, you're different astrological types. <laughs> uh, Now, it gets very complex here. Uh, we need a new typology and a whole new uh, system of understanding what's happening. I happen to prefer the astrological diagnostic system, but Jung's or any, it's got to be, your system of understanding who you are at level two would be helped if you understood the uh, pantheon of gods from Hinduism or from Olympus, because you were playing the part of Venus and Mars, or yeah, now here comes Vulcan and uh, there goes uh, Hermes and <laughs> and uh, then, of course, when you do merge, you do get four arms instead of two, and then you become Kali and Shiva and Willikitsri. The more you know about these, because uh, you're now in the God game, or the mythic game, and the more you know about these the tarot cards, uh, you get any help you can to chart your way through this complex... Uh, <laughs> <coughs> now, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, we have many of these uh, racial cards playing around, and those of you who have had many deep cycle experiences know that you spin through many reincarnations, because uh, it's all there in the DNA code, and not only are they, they're all human, but some of these humans are pretty untidy humans with long jaws and unfriendly uh, musculature, and then you even have the possibility, you know, I'd say even the certainty, that many of your ancestral racial uh, karmic astrological uh, flashes are going to be subhuman, that is, this incredible range of animals, and uh, rams, and lions, and so forth. Uh, there was a famous case of the psychologist from Los Angeles who went down to Oaxaca at the village of Hualat and he was going to take the sacred mushrooms with uh, Maria Sabrina and he did and uh, being possessed by uh, spirits uh, at level two he leaped out of the window of the hut and ran around the village and was found by the alarmed uh, villagers devouring a turkey. <laughs> a live turkey. Now I submit to you that that is not uh, social conditioning. Uh, some, something bubbled up from this uh, racial thing, and uh, you have another explanation, but if you can explain that, you have to explain to me why uh, every system of psychiatry and every system of, uh, of uh, folklore tells us about animism and totemism and the feeling of that you're one with animals or that you're taken over by animals, uh, not to mention the Elks and the Lions Club in our country, <laughs> and, and so forth. And of course, that brings us back to astrology. Um, uh, the point is that when you get to level two, a whole new ball game starts, and uh, there's endless delight as you uh, take, uh, you have uh, sessions. Uh, uh, if you're, uh, if they're marital sessions, uh, it becomes hide and seek because as you spin down these reincarnation ladders, you know, uh, you're popping up uh, on this stage, uh, you know, in the 17th century, and she's uh, somewhere in an intergalactic uh, uh, effulgence, and uh, the game of hide and seek goes on which uh, just as a, as a straight um, um, you know, 
ecstatic uh, intellectual challenge uh, not to be overlooked. Now, the fact that uh, you do discover after a while that you have certain, you have a soul or you have a certain essence or a small repertoire of essences that are very powerful, uh, ancient rhythms that uh, just can't be denied and that are probably central to you, then you have to bring them in touch with her, which uh, again is an uh, interesting process. Uh, but uh, you don't have to worry about being stuck there because uh, the next step is to transcend your astrological type. Uh, I think I mentioned this uh, briefly the other night. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to close in a minute and invite uh, any of you in the audience that would like to come up and share your visions or experiences in this topic. Before I do that, I would like to be rather specific and to... Um, uh, give you some empirical data on what we have found about which genetic types, which genetic types are likely to uh, groove with a psychedelic drug or tantric uh, uh, road to God, and which astrological types probably, uh, at least at this particular time, or perhaps in different rhythms, uh, better off not to take psychedelic drugs and stir up your uh, sensory and somatic energies, but try instead to get in tune with one big harmony and do it through obedience and surrender, but do it. Uh, now, this is a very risky thing, and uh, I must warn you not to take any of this uh, with anything except um, uh, you know, interest. That it, it may stir you to think about some of these matters, which we consider uh, quite important. Uh, see, the interesting thing is that... Uh, and by doing, just doing studies of the people that we know and have been in our side of communities, there are incredible psychological correlations about who is going to stay on the psychedelic path and who is going to stay with the tantric path and who is going to go on to a, uh, a laser type, a one beam, one ohm type. Now, this may, not have, uh, may or may not have anything to do with your experience, uh, but I would like to point out a couple of technical aspects about this. So if you want to study uh, genetic types, I don't care whether you call them astrological or what you call them, if you want to study you know, genetic types, you're going to have a hard time doing it with a population of people who live in the suburbs and are conditioned to the fourth and fifth level. Because they don't know what the hell their genetic type is. They just know that you turn left when the buzzer rings and you turn right when that buzzer rings. <laughs> so what's your genetic type? And they say, well, that sounds like a void. <laughs> Which means that no matter what your racial uh, system is, if it's astrological, all right, you're not going to find uh, out much about people by going down to the suburb. You can go to any suburb and neighborhood and you'll find 12 houses. You may have 12 different astrological types there, but all the 12 different men uh, cut their hair the same and they wear the same kind of suits and drive the same kind of cars to the CIA and the uh, IBM and you know, <laughs> professors of Cal and so forth. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so you're not going to learn much by observing them. You say, well, Jones, yeah, I don't see the difference. Jones is a Libra and uh, Smith is a Taurus. I don't see the difference. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> half voted for Nixon, half voted for Humphrey. <laughs> What's astrology at? <laughs> the point is that if you're going to study astrological or genetic or racial types, you have to get people who are in touch with them. Uh, and that's where the, uh, the, the uh, psychedelic communities come into uh, action. Uh, there's one thing you can say about psychedelic people, psychedelic communities, I don't, and it's neither good nor bad. But, um, psychedelic life does give more freedom of room for a person to express what he wants to. Uh, that's, well, sometimes you think that many uh, psychedelic people are just doing the opposite of what they, they used to do, but um, there is more opportunity for uh, living out your thing in a hippie ranch or a hippie commune or a hippie pad. Uh, and you, you know, one can wear this kind of uniform, the other one can wear that. Uh, and uh, if you observe, uh, and also you see, most uh, Americans are tied down to jobs. You know, they just can't, just can't pick up man and split IBM. Because <laughs> you, know? you, you heard someone's turning on in the crater in Hawaii, and let's go over there for a while, and, and you, know, you just can't do it. Uh, but psychedelic people, uh, and the psychedelic community, which does, amazingly enough, Help it, you know, help people survive, and you can pass uh, around the world today and uh, never leave this incredible network of people. Somehow or other, you'll, you know, you can, uh, you won't starve. 
So the psychedelic people have had the, the social mobility, <laughs> if I may say so, to be able to, um, to uh, move from place to place, and from wife to wife, or mate to mate, or they can follow this yoga and that yoga and this yoga and that yoga and so forth. Uh, I think this is not atypical of the, of the psychedelic person. So that when uh, I get a list of uh, 50 psychedelic, or 100 psychedelic marriages, uh, or, or 100 psychedelic people that have been married and aren't now, uh, I submit that I'm more likely to get uh, uh, pictures about uh, what their essence or their genetic uh, behavior could be. Now, with all this preliminary and warnings that this may have nothing to do with uh, your circle of friends, I will say this, uh, that there's half of the astrological circle that I think tends to point you away from psychedelic drugs and half of the cycle that tends to push you in the direction of psychedelic drugs and probably uh, the spiritual marriage. Uh, those of you who know astrology, you'll know what I'm talking about, but those of you who don't, ask questions about it later. And I, I mean, you know, this is probably the dumbest. I've done plenty of reckless things in my life, or I wouldn't be here. This is probably the most reckless thing I've ever done. Goodbye. <laughs> In, in our communities, uh, most of the people who have uh, left uh, the psychedelic movement <laughs> and become heretics, <laughs> excommunicated, <laughs> tend to uh, uh, be uh, Aries, Aquarius, Pisces, uh, Capricorn, Sagittarius, and uh, possibly Scorpio. And those who have uh, stayed with uh, the uh, psychedelic yoga uh, tend to be uh, Taurus through Libra. That's Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. Now I think that what uh, probably is going on here is you have something like this. Uh, The I Ching is a thing to consult. <laughs> We're also working on um, a system of bodily postures based on the I Ching. Uh, what's this? <laughs> well, you see. Uh, I want to say something more about posture, as a matter of fact. <coughs> well, yeah. Um, what we're dealing with here are, um, are um, I think, proton and uh, electron and neutron charges. But to give you an example, uh, at one psychedelic commune, there are an enormous number of Capricorn ladies. Uh, and you say, well, uh, what are they doing in the psychedelic community? Well, they're all married to Leos. <laughs> uh, but uh, here's an interesting uh, finding. If you consider that uh, above this line is, uh, is A, and below the line is, say, plus. Your chances of a enduring psychedelic marriage, if you are above this line, uh, with a, another person above the line, are practically, uh, it's almost impossible. Of a hundred marriages, uh, we've had only five marriages among this Aquarius, uh, Pisces, Gemini, Capricorn, Sagittarius, uh, Scorpio, and three of them were Scorpio. 
Um, 47% of these marriages, uh, it was, uh, um, and uh, 48% it was uh, that way. <laughs> Uh, you know the rules of the game. You're God and I'm God. Uh, okay. Uh, I, no complaints about the pay. Uh, uh, it's a full-time job. Uh, uh, I can't even help you at all. I'm having enough trouble with Rosemary and I. <laughs> but uh, uh, it does require, uh, like you start right from the beginning, you've got to be your own Moses and you've got to decide about the Ten Commandments and you've got to be Galileo and discover the laws of gravity and magnetism. There's a lot to learn there, by the way. Uh, uh, like, uh, if you're really going to, I say, if you're going to get to level one, posture is tremendously important. What is the posture that if it really happened, when it really happened, like that uh, transmitter down the middle of the earth, it, when it's going to go zoop someday and everything is going to be pulled down in energy, what position do you want to be in? Because the way you hit the ground is going to be, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, what's the basic posture? Is it the lotus position? It's obviously not this. Hold off for an hour. <laughs> Is it the lowest position? Well, not maybe. I don't know. Uh, but the lowest position, you can go this way, that way. You're going to fall over one way or the other, or you're just going to go down like that. Uh, I would say that the basic position for uh, the female. Uh, I, I am mad, right? <laughs> Be seated, dear. <laughs> I mean, this is not pornographic at all. This is physics. <laughs> I was on a television program last night, and uh, it was lucky I wasn't run out of town because of the terrible things that were going down in that program. Uh, and all, the uh, announcer started quoting sex, this, sex, that, sex, this, sex, that, sex, that, and then drugs, 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 and questions, people asking questions, drugs, drugs. And I kept saying, well, we're talking about feel good and hedonic or agathis, you know, and they say, feel drugs, 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 sex, sex, orgies, yeah, <laughs> those are fun, folks. I said, well, you know, hedonic, yeah, and so forth. You're the dirtiest man, why, I've ever, never, you know, and you're perverted, so I said, Finally, at the end of the said, I'd like to make one announcement that, to my knowledge, uh, I have talked about nothing except uh, the uh, ple pleasurable engineering. I don't think I've mentioned drugs or sex once. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, if you can imagine a mountain, you see, and a valley, well, uh, Help. <laughs> You'll find her there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> see, because that, it's actually it's a sine wave because, uh, And the space in between those uh, is uh, highly charged. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sine wave. <laughs> uh, all right. um, I want to close by reading uh, two. Um, <laughs> two uh, this is the New Testament, according to uh, Max Shear and the Berkeley Barb. <laughs> This is a quote from a person that has taught me a great deal and I'm proud to call one of my gurus. Um, I'm half tempted to read it and you know who it was, but I'll tell you, it's Eldridge Cleaver. Eldridge Cleaver, the quote is saying, because we have a garden and we're not going to bring it down to earth and we're not going to be tricked again by this punk called Adam and the God, the landlord of that day, like he had St. Michael, the archangel, I think he's Irish. He was just a racist pig cop. 
The landlord said, those people in my land down there eating my apples in my land, and I tell them not to do that shit. You need to go down there and kick them off my property. And don't take your regular old sword. Take that new sword that Einstein invented. Take that flaming sword and tell Adam, that bitch too, to get out. <laughs> so Michael said, Heil Hitler. <laughs> And then he went down there to do his duties and to enforce the law. And he said, okay, Adam, let's go. You're blocking the sidewalk. <laughs> let's get out of here. <laughs> and then Adam said, okay, let's go. The pig got the gun. <laughs> so Eve was a jive bitch. But she had been hip to pussy power. All she had to do was just sit down and say, well, you just go off, Adam, and jack off, because I'm going to stay right here and fuck the devil if you leave. <laughs> And if Eve had done those things, I'm sure Adam uh, would have stuck around and fuck all those bootlicking women because they're just for anything those chumps have to say. So just because Adam walked out of the Garden of Eden, we've been catching hell for 2,000 years, but what we needed was a motherfucker like Huey P. <laughs> Newton. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's, um, that's an incredibly powerful, uh, poetic create a mixture of uh, about 85 levels of consciousness, uh, uh, which um, um, uh, I think has some tantra in it. <laughs> and much wisdom. And uh, now I'll conclude for the moment by reading a prayer. <laughs> This is from the East Village Other, taken from the Tao Te Ching. It's based on uh, verse 42 of the Tao Te Ching, and it's entitled, What Now, Great Tao? <laughs> <laughs> Out of Tao, the one is born. I mean the one sun she shined, you mustn't mind, I think you find it's beyond our kind. Out of the two, out of the one the two divide. I'll arrive alive via the U.S. mailbag, three cried. So out of the two mated, we created the three. It's fun to blend, but where will it end and what will become of our coming? We sighed and died. Consider the mathematics, click the DNA computer softly. One equals done, two equals nothing new, but the number three, variety. When multiplied, 10,000 forms are supplied with fins, feather, all sorts of leather coverings. What is the name of this inexhaustibly inventive game, we inquired, as we lay moist in each other's arms? Will we grow tired? Will it grow tame as we excel in playing this game, always poop, cooped up in a permeable cell? Is it time to re-enter? The center, what now, great Tao, or should we even ask? Thank you. <laughs>